to everyone. Now, I'm not speaking of religion. I understand there's a lot of Christianity that has become simply religion. And then there's, there's violence, and there's judging, and there's hatred, and there's divisiveness. and That has nothing to do with Christianity. You understand, Jesus said, you will know those who say they're Christians, you'll know my followers by their fruitfulness. Fruitfulness, the first fruit of the Holy Spirit is repentance. That there's a humility and a humbleness before God to allow God to change us from the inside out. And then the fruitfulness begins to develop as love and joy and peace. We have compassion and faithfulness and we encourage and we bless. So you cannot actually, we can name the name of Jesus and say we're Christians, but if we're not functioning in this fashion, at least in heaven's eyes, we are very, very confused, maybe a little bit spiritually schizophrenic. You know, the scripture says God knows those who are his. We don't need to sort that out. But those who name the name of Jesus will turn away from iniquity. They will turn away from those things that hurt people and they will, and they will gravitate towards the things that God wants them to do, to love, to forgive, to encourage, to bless, to strengthen. This is the work of God. And this is developed in a community of believers who then impact the community that they've been placed in strategically by the Holy Spirit. And we've got not just thousands, but millions upon millions upon millions of local congregations that are impacting uh, the communities that they are in all around the world. We pray for at least one other church, one other community of believers every time we gather together, and I would hope that you'd be praying for our missionaries and and other local churches in the area and around the world every time you gather together because the church, the local church, not the church in some nebulous way, you know, some philosophical way, but the local church of committed followers of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. It's the, it, it, it has and has been entrusted with the message of reconciliation with God the Father through Jesus Christ. Now, let's come back to why that's important. One of the prophets in the Old Testament, Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 10, talking about the tithe, said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. No one doubts that the storehouse is an Old Testament picture of the New Testament church. That's pretty much clear and established. Any scholar would say so. But what is in the storehouse then comes out of the storehouse. What has been placed in the storehouse, the tithe that, the, that, that believers return onto the Lord, then something comes out of the storehouse. And that first thing that comes out of the storehouse is a proclamation of the good news, the gospel, both here in our local fellowship but then throughout the community that we live in. And the gospel is proclaimed to all ages, all age levels, if you will, in a way that they can understand it. That's our first and highest priority. And so we send out invitations. We encourage the community to learn about God, to learn about Jesus Christ. We want to welcome them and love on them and encourage them when we are around them or when they show up here on a a Sunday in our community of believers or on a Wednesday or at some other time at one of our many groups that, that meet. But also local social needs are addressed, whether it's food or whether it's clothing and all the various things that local churches do. Global needs are addressed, missions around the world where we're bringing a message to people that have not yet received it and a local church hasn't been planted or we dig a, a well for a community that has no water or we supply livestock for a family uh, that's just trying to get by. These are all things that we do And it's all things that local churches do around the world. So what goes into the storehouse is meant to come out of the storehouse to do ministry and to make a difference in the community. So that's really the first reason that I tithe and why I think it's important to tithe. But there's a second reason that Christians tithe, and that is because tithing teaches me to put God first. It teaches us to put God first. Listen to the scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23. The purpose of the tithe is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. 
That's the purpose of the tithe. That's a shocker, because we would think the purpose of the tithe is to fulfill your obligation, meet the dictates of the law, or do something, or, or even what I just said, to make sure the, the ministry of a local church is effective. And we have all kinds of things we can think about regarding it, but here the Scripture is saying there's a deeper pur purpose for us individually, and that is it teaches us to put God first in our lives. Seek God first. He's our first. We seek him, I hope, in the morning when we awake. We seek the Lord first to get our minds and our thoughts focused on what's going to happen for the rest of the day. We worship him on the first day of the week in order to get our week established in the Lord. Uh, many of us fast during the first month of the year, so we're letting the Lord know that our lives are completely His, and we give of the first of everything that He gives to us. See, it requires faith to give first. It doesn't require faith to give last with whatever the leftovers are. And the Scripture is very clear, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I can hear even in my own thoughts, things that I've thought over the years, things that others might be thinking. I didn't welcome, I failed to welcome those who are with us online or following us, uh, you know, this service from around the world, and, I, and I, I, I do welcome you, and I'm so glad you're listening in. If you're still listening in, because <laughs> I'm talking about tithing and I'm talking about money, uh, you might say, well, uh, Charles, I, you don't get it to tithe I would have to make major changes in my life. Actually, I do get it. You say, well, I'd have to reprioritize my life around God. Yeah, I think we're getting there. I, I think we're getting to the point of what it means that tithing teaches me to put God first. Because many professing Christians, they fail to realize that God owns everything anyway. I, I know the secular mind isn't going to think that, but even professing Christians sometimes don't get it. First Chronicles chapter 29, just one verse that talks about this, verse 11, everything in heaven and earth is yours, O Lord. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. You know, a pastor said a story that I heard this week, and I cannot tell you the pastor's name uh, because to do so, uh, you know, might, might not seem kind. But, but it, was a, it was a true story, and it was his own story. Basically, he, he was saying something about what he did when he was a young person. He was around 12 years old, and he was allowed in his church. He had grown up in church, unlike me. I did not, but he had grown up within a local congregation. Uh, I think it's Southern Baptist that can narrow down a little bit who this pastor is, but I'm still not going to mention his name because he was being allowed to take the offering on Sundays. You know, you pass the place. We, pa we pass buckets. We want lots in there. He, they just pass plates. And, uh, and they passed the place, and when he got to the back of the room, when no one was looking, he'd sneak a dollar off the top, put it in his pocket. Serious. And he did this for weeks and weeks and weeks. He didn't really say how long he did it, but he did it for a long time. And then, once the place had been turned in, he'd disappear for five minutes. And people wouldn't know what, where he was, but he would, you know, appear back in and join the service. You know, what he was doing was going down to a little local... Uh, um, you know, candy store, he could buy some ice cream, he eat his ice cream, he'd come back to church. He loved church, you know, because church meant he was going to have ice cream with his stolen money. He was stealing the money. But, you know, we have a lot of Christians who are driving stolen cars. We have a lot of Christians who are wearing stolen clothing. If you're going to look at this biblically, here's why I say that. Listen to the prophet Malachi Chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You're, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. All I can say is, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want that said about me. 
Now, I understand that there are always going to be uh, opinions, and a lot of folks lay those opinions out there. Some Christians will say, well, the tithe is from the law, and we're not under the law, and so they're not going to do it. And, and that's fine. I get it. Go, don't do it. Don't tithe. Do what's in your heart. You know, let, be led by the Holy Spirit. But actually, as I already showed, the tithe predates the law by nearly five centuries. We saw that with Abraham and, and, uh, and that mysterious person, Melchizedek. And, and so when I do explain that to someone because they wanted to talk about this, it's not a big topic that I'm always talking about, but if, I, if someone wanted to discuss it and I say, well, you know, it really isn't just about the law, it predates the law by nearly five centuries, I'll say, yeah, but it's Old Testament. I mean, Jesus never mentioned it. And that seems to always end the conversation, except that's not true. Jesus actually affirmed the tithe in the New Testament. And I see some heads shaking yes, because you know where I'm going with this. Because we find in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Jesus saying to the religious leaders, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. And so we stop there. We say, well, you see, he just said tithing is not important. What we should do is just have justice, mercy, and faith. But he goes on to say, you should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Say, but Charles, aren't you saying tithing is important? Tithing is where we begin as Christians. We should tithe. Yes, it's the first thing. It's Christianity 101. It's what we do as brand new Christians. We say, okay, the Lord has changed me. Now the tithe is His. I'm returning the tithe. But what Jesus is saying, yes, you should do that. It's the first thing. It's what you do as a baby Christian. But don't forget the offerings. Don't forget missions around the world. Don't forget grace. Don't forget compassion. Don't forget generosity. Don't forget mercy. Don't forget justice. Remember, Jesus always internalized things. We say, well, we're not Old Testament, we're New Testament. That doesn't make it easier. Jesus internalized what was in the Old Testament, external, is now internal through the Holy Spirit operating through us. You remember, the Old Testament says, thou shalt not murder, and Jesus says, we shall not even hate, right? Because to hate is the same as murder, according to our Savior. Or, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. And for men, you know, would be for women too, but he says, you know, regarding men, you shouldn't even look at a woman with lust in your heart because that would be adultery. He's internalizing what is in the Old Testament external, but in the New Testament internal. By the way, it's internal in the Old Testament too, but they could ignore that and try to do it just as an external religious observance. So Jesus is making it very clear. It was always meant to be internal. It was always meant to be something that God does through us by the Holy Spirit. Yes, you tithe, but Jesus is saying it's your whole life that belongs to God. It's all His. All you are for the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and then God will add on to you these other things that you need. All that you are for the work of the kingdom. So that's, that's how the Lord taught tithing. But there's a third reason that I tithe, and that I think Christians tithe, and it's because tithing builds my faith in God. Tithing builds my faith. You know, I've been talked, uh, I, I've had a lot of conversations with people over the years, as you can imagine, and I've had Christians come to me, and they say things like, I, I, I don't know how to have faith. I don't know how to have faith. I've said yes to Jesus, they're follow, they're, they want to be Christians. I don't know how to have faith. And I surprise them on occasion, if I feel, if I feel it's appropriate at that moment to say it, I'll, I'll say, well, are you tithing? And it always surprises them. But listen to the prophet Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will give God my first and my best so that he can bless the rest. Test me in this. 
And then we think, bless how? We always, maybe not you, but a lot think, you know, well, that must be financial blessing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie the dollar, and God will give me $10 back. And, and I know sometimes we, we hear some teaching along those lines, and I'm not here to give anyone a hard time. But that's really not the blessing that the Lord is talking about here. Uh, yeah, it's financial, but it's the whole of life. That's really, you know, when I, well, you know how you go, you go to high school, you have the high school prom, and they have, they, they're you know, voted, someone's going to be voted most likely to be president. Voted, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Voted most likely to be a beauty queen, or voted most likely to be a, a quarterback in the NFL, or voted most likely. Well, some of you uh, may not know that I'm a high school dropout. I dropped out of high school. You know, I never got in my, never did my 12th year of high school. Just gone. And, and uh, I always find that to be kind of funny, because here you are listening to me. I think it's such poetic justice, you know, that somehow, you know, you're listening to me, and, and, uh, and I'm a high school dropout, and so, praise God for the, for the humor of this whole thing, uh, and, and, but, uh, you know, at the prom, you know, I was voted most likely to be dead by age 25. No, I didn't go to my prom because I dropped out of high school. But if they had voted me anything, it would have been that. Because I never once thought back in that day that I would get out of my 20s. I wasn't sure I'd get into my mid-20s. Uh, there are reasons for that, along with drug addi addiction and, and alcohol abuse and the lifestyle that I was living. I was traveling with a band. That's how I made my living. Uh, you know, without getting into all of that, I will just say that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I didn't know that I would really be alive the next day. And, and the truth is, is I didn't care. Yeah, truth is, I didn't care. And, and yet, I look, at my <laughs> I look at my life today, I'm a little older, and go ahead, go ahead, snicker, snicker. I'm a, I'm a little older, but God has so blessed me. I look back at my life and I say, how did this happen? How did this happen? He, I have been blessed in my life beyond anything I ever imagined. Without getting into all the adventures and the wonderful ministry opportunities and the life I've lived, I'm very thankful for it. But family, home, work, meaningful, friends, grandchildren, uh, you know, it's just awesome. In fact, my son, Pastor Nathan, out in Los Angeles, uh, Jessica is pregnant uh, with a, for coming, expecting a third. So that'll be seven grandchildren. <clears throat> We're going for a dozen. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and I had all four of the, of the East Coast little grandchildren, two little girls on the West Coast, all four and, uh, over yesterday, and we were just having a ball. I'm thinking, I'm out, I'm out in the yard. Uh, Josh and I got, got rope and tied it to, um, uh, you know, inflatable sleds, that were the tubes, put these kids on them, tore them around the front yard. The goal was to knock them off, right? And, uh, and, and so if you're visiting with us, they're all under the age of four. And, and, uh, and, and I'm watching as, you know, they're holding on for dear life, laughing as I'm sp we're spinning them around. And at one point, Josh and I, I don't know what we were thinking, he starts spinning in a circle, like just spinning them. So I said, that's cool. I'm spinning another one of the little guys in a circle until they would cram right into each other, up in the air. I fell down. It was great. It was great. I, I should have been dead a long time ago. God has blessed me. Not because I tithe. Don't misunderstand me. He hasn't blessed me because I tithe. He's blessed me because I've chosen to live a life of faith in His Son, Jesus, and all that that implies, and to put the Lord first in my life. And I have absolutely no regrets. But tithing is about faith. You know, a lot of churches do this, and we, we do it here. Uh, we, we rarely get called on it, but I'll say it to you. Uh, we don't give out anything special, any fancy stuff or whatever. But if you say, you know what, I, I get it. I want to put the Lord first. I'm going to reprioritize my finances. We'll help you. You know, in our other messages, we talked about all of those things. Uh, and we can also meet with you privately to try to help you work out budgets and finances and anything we can do, debt snowballs to get out of debt. We will try to uh, help you and we will support you in any way we can. And there are many of you who know that we do that on a regular basis. But I've told people over the years, 
okay, now you're ready, you're going you're gonna to function in faith, you begin to tithe, and you do it for a week, and three weeks, and five weeks, and six, you get up to maybe three months, and if after three months you're thinking, this is awful, my life has fallen apart, things are worse than they've ever been, you have every right, assuming you've been doing this by check, and we have a record of what you've done, you come, I'll get you together with our church treasurer, Brother Bob, uh, and we'll return all that money to you. Because the Lord said, test me in this. So I'm not trying to be gimmicky, okay? Uh, I, I, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I know that that sounds like a gimmick. That's not what I mean. I'm just saying I'm so convinced that the Lord will honor your faith that within three months or so, you're going to already know that it's been worth it. That there's, you know, that somehow 90% of everything you have with God's blessing is worth more and blesses you more than 100%. Of what you have. I, just, I just think the Lord will reveal this to you as you return the tithe on to Him. Faith to give first. Give God my first and my best so that He can bless the rest. And remember this, just food for thought, and I've said it before, what you do with what you have reveals what you really believe about God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and we ask in the name above all names, the name of your Son, Jesus, that you would help us to understand your word in this area and in all areas of our lives, in our homes, in our families, in our relationships, in our work ethic, in our integrity, in our character, in how we worship, in how we bless, in how we strengthen, in how we forgive, in how we show compassion, in how we offer grace. Lord, in all of these things, continue to teach us, strengthen us, uh, help us to develop and to mature as your sons and as your daughters, as followers of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah, Jesus. And maybe there's one person here today, maybe just one, who would say, you know, I have never really taken hold of who Jesus is for me personally. And I would say to you, even as we're praying, that the Lord has invested in you. He's invested His Son, Jesus, who gave His life on a cross to pay for your stubbornness, your selfishness, your sin, to forgive you and reconcile you to God the Father. And in so doing, to turn your life upside down, to change you and give direction that you would be led by the Holy Spirit and that you would grow and mature as a man of God or as a woman of God. You may be that one person today and you're saying, I want that. I'm not talking to you about your money. I'm not talking to you about tithing. I'm talking to you about who you are. I'm talking to you about eternity. I'm talking to you about your soul. Maybe today, yes, today is your moment. This is your moment. This is your moment. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today. And so no one's looking around. Right now, focus and say, this is my day, this is my day, to get right with God. And if you've come to that conclusion, I want you to pray with me right now. Pray this prayer. Say, Father, I give my life to you, because that's where it all begins. Father, I give my life to you. I receive your Son, Jesus, as my Savior, that He died for me, that I could be forgiven of my sin and be reconciled to you, Father, and have a relationship with you. Not religion, relationship. So, forgive me and fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might hear your voice in my thoughts, 
that I might receive direction through your word so that I might live the life you've designed me to live, that you've called me to live. And I thank you for this, for I ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Before we dismiss, uh, if that happens to be you, and you're out there and you're the one who just prayed along with Pastor and in that prayer of giving your life to Jesus, and that maybe that's a new idea, you know, that he doesn't want you just to subscribe to some religion, but that Jesus desires a relationship with you. If that's you in this place and you prayed the prayer in front of you, in the chair in front of you, there's a little card that says decision. If you would take that card and just write your name on it, take it back into the lobby after the service. We have people that want to meet with you, that want to answer any questions you might have. They just want to be there as a support. We want to make sure that we get behind you and the decision that you've made today. And so please don't walk out without doing that. For the rest of you, as always, there's communion here up at the altar. You can come and respond to God, respond to what the Holy Spirit may be saying to you, may be challenging you, may be asking of you. We're just going to pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, you're so good. You're so good. We thank you for your word, for all that you've spoken to us through this series, Strapped. Lord, I pray that as we prepare to leave, that you would remind us of all the things that your Holy Spirit desires to speak to us, that you'd send them with us as we go, that you'd bring them back to our memories throughout the next days and weeks and months and even years to come that you would grow our faith. Now let your blessing be upon your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. Have a great week.